This island in southern Thailand is not like the others. Of course, there are plenty of amazing beaches here, but culturally, it's a bit of an anomaly. The people here were descended from sea gypsies, and the population now is predominantly Muslim. And for many years now, this has been known as a very quiet island, even before the pandemic. So join me as we discover what Koh Lanta is like in 2022. The name Koh Lanta refers to a collection of 16 islands in the south of Thailand, but mostly when people use the name, they're talking about the two largest islands of Koh Lanta Noi and Koh Lanta Yai, with the latter being the main destination for tourists. And today's journey begins on a quiet beach on the west coast of that very island. Good morning and welcome back to another day in Thailand, where you join me from one of the many beaches on the island of Koh Lanta. Now, Koh Lanta is a large island off the coast of Krabi, but despite its large size, it's always been a bit of an enigma when it comes to tourism. Unlike its popular neighbours of Koh Phi Phi or Phuket, this place has always been a little bit quiet even before the pandemic, so I'm very interested to see what it's going to be like right now. We arrived here yesterday on a speedboat from Koh Phi Phi Island, and there's actually normally a ferry service and a speedboat service that run between the two islands, but the demand to come here right now is so low that there's only the speedboat service running twice a day. So the plan for this morning is to start exploring exactly what this island has to offer, but I want to kick things off by showing you where we've been staying, because it's a very nice place. So welcome to the Moonlight Exotic Bay Resort, where we're staying for the next three nights. Koh Lanta may be a very quiet and rustic place, but you can still find some really lovely resorts here. And if you ask me, if you need a golf buggy to get over to your room, it's probably a pretty decent spot. This is without a doubt the nicest hotel we've stayed in during our trip so far, but it's also the most expensive. So let me give you a quick tour around the resort and then we'll talk prices. This is a three-star hotel, but I reckon it feels like it's a little bit higher. In terms of facilities, you've got a good-sized swimming pool, and right next to that, there's a really nice restaurant and bar area. It's also got its own gym and fitness room, and the whole resort is set along its own private beach, which is quite a rocky one, but there's some lovely decking areas all along the sand, and there's some great places to just sit down, relax, and take in the views. It's better with towel, sure. I'm assuming. Oh, that's, that's a hot cushion. And some of these spots are particularly good for sunset, when you can just sit there, relax with a chang or a cocktail in your hand, watching the sun go down over the sea. It's really, really nice. And to be honest, this whole resort just feels like it's perfect for couples. We booked a sea view cottage, which is its own self-contained unit, and it's a really lovely space. No, no, not today. <laughs> Thank you. I really like the decoration in here and just the look of the hotel in general. It's really, really nicely done out. But of course, the highlight of a sea view cottage should be the sea view. So let's get out on the balcony and have a look at that. Well, take a look at this. What a view. And I love this little round sofa here, which is yet another great place to sit down, relax take in the views, watch the sunset. Ah, oh, it's perfect. Now, of course, great rooms like this also come at a price. We paid 67 pounds per night for this room, and overall, I think it's worth it. So anyway, enough about the hotel. It's time to get out there and start exploring the island. Right then, the plan for today is to take the road down south towards the National Park area right at the bottom of the island. And if there's any stops along the way, we'll take a look. We rented a bike from our hotel for 250 baht per day. And on the road, we already noticed that the usual Buddhist temples of Thailand had been replaced by the colorful domes and spires of Koh Lanta's many mosques. Muslim migrants are believed to have arrived on the island over 300 years ago and now it's the majority faith across the population of 20,000 people, making it the only predominantly Muslim island in all of Thailand. Our hotel was located in a pretty central location on the west coast in Klong Ninh, so it was only a 25 minute ride down to the national park. The roads definitely get a bit more windy and steep as you head further south, but generally the condition of them is pretty good. I'd heard that the roads on Koh Lanta can be pretty rocky, but apart from a few bumpy patches, it was generally okay. 
And now we've made it to the National Park, which is home to some of the most famous views on the whole island. The entire collection of Koh Lanta Islands are technically part of a national park zone, and this small area in the very south acts as its main headquarters. There's a 200 baht entrance fee per foreigner, along with a 20 baht parking charge for bikes. And inside you'll find some facilities and a campsite, as well as two very different beaches, with Tanod Beach being the most picturesque. But right in the middle of that coastline, you have the famous Koh Lanta Lighthouse, sitting right on top of the hill, which is without a doubt the island's most recognisable postcard shot. So after we parked up, we naturally headed towards that spot by walking along the rocky shoreline. There is a sign at the bottom of the hill here that says no climbing. But we did ask a guard at the gate if it was okay to climb up to the lighthouse and he said walking okay. So we're just gonna go for it and see what happens. Well then, after a very short climb, we have made it to the top. And here is the cute little lighthouse. We've got this whole top bit to ourselves. And actually the national park in general is very, very quiet. There's some lovely views from up here. On one side, you've got a very rocky beach. And on the other side, it's a beautiful, pristine white beach. Lovely. It's quite cool looking from the lighthouse back towards the mainland because the landscapes here are kind of mirrored. You've got the rocky beach on one side and the white sand beach on the other side. And it's kind of like a mirrored image. Pretty awesome. Ah, uh, yeah. Amazing. Obviously a beautiful beach in its own right when you get it all to yourself like this it's not bad at all so this national park area is quite small but there is one more trail you can do up to a viewpoint so let's go and check that out now the nature trail takes you on a climb right into the jungle above the beaches you start down at the main car park which leads into a pretty overgrown and steep section before it all levels out into a crumbled pathway and what I didn't realise at the time is that this isn't really a trail up to a viewpoint as such, but more of a nature trail in its own right. So if it's a view that you're after, just walk away from the lighthouse along Tanod Beach and you'll find some steps leading to a semi-obscured view. But luckily, right after that, we would find some much better views. I wonder where you went. <laughs> <laughs> We headed north back along that same road, stopping at a little roadside restaurant for lunch. The food here was good, but the view from up on that hill was even better. And Bamboo Beach is known to be one of the most beautiful stretches of sand on the whole of Koh Lanta. One thing I've already noticed about the beaches of Koh Lanta compared to Phuket or Phi Phi is that there's not a lot of development along the back of the beaches. So down on the end here, you've got one resort and a few restaurants up on the hill where we had lunch, but behind the beach, it's just greenery. And I haven't seen a lot of that over the past couple of weeks. It almost reminds me of the Philippines here. A lot of the beaches there aren't so developed and you don't have the beach bars along the back. So it's quite refreshing to see this. We then continued north along the coast to Kantian Bay which is actually much more developed than the other beaches we'd seen down in the south. The water here is very calm and the beach itself has lots of small hotels and bars, but still no real crowds of people. And just outside of the main town, we also saw some of the sad side effects of the last couple of years. Coming out of the Kantiang beach area, there's quite a lot of restaurants and cafes that used to be up on this hill looking down over the beach, but now they look uh, pretty abandoned, to be honest, which is sad to see because I bet at one point this was quite a popular spot to come down from a town that's quite lively. And up here you can watch the sunset, have a cocktail, fruit shake. 
yeah, sad to see places like this. Good morning. It is now day three on Koh Lanta, and the plan for today is to start off by stepping away from the beaches of the west coast and head over to the east side of the island, which is home to Koh Lanta Old Town, which was originally a sea gypsy settlement that then became the most important port on the island. So should be a bit different, should be interesting. Let's go and check it out. The very first settlers arrived on Koh Lanta about 500 years ago in the form of the Chow Lei people, nomadic sea gypsies who sought refuge during the monsoon season. But the years that followed saw the arrival of Chinese merchant ships when Sri Raya or Lanta Old Town became a major port and commercial centre for the island where tin, charcoal and dried fish were all commonly traded. Well, just across the way over there is the Koh Lanta Old Town. And as you're about to see, this isn't like a lot of the other old towns you'll see in Southeast Asia. This one, it's a bit different. Rather than being filled with the Sino-Portuguese architecture of old towns like Phuket, this area is made up of more low-key wooden buildings, which are now mainly there to serve tourists. This whole strip is filled with souvenir shops and cafes, and stepping out to the back of these spots, you can see that they all stand on stilts right in the water, offering some great views towards the nearby islands of the national park. These days, it's almost hard to imagine the Koh Lanta Old Town as a bustling commercial hub, but there is still another area of this island which, even right now, has much more life to it. So far, most of what we've seen on Koh Lanta has been very subdued, but that's because we haven't yet ventured near its most popular beaches in the north. So this is Praia Beach, or Long Beach to use its more literal name, because it is very, very long. Alongside Klong Dao Beach, which is just further north, these two are probably the most popular resort towns on the whole of Koh Lanta. And you can really tell when you drive through the towns, there's a lot of restaurants, bars and resorts, a lot of which are open. There's some closed, as is the case in most little seaside towns in Thailand, but there's a lot open. It's not busy by any stretch of the imagination, but I can see why people come here for a bit more atmosphere. But we're here for a very specific reason, to go and visit a very, very special place that takes care of the island's furry friends. Just a few kilometers back from the beach, you'll find Lanta Animal Welfare. Founded in 2005, this is the only place of its kind on the whole island. And over the years, they've sterilized and treated over 15,000 animals, as well as helping to get cats and dogs adopted to new homes all over the world. There's one tour per day at 11 a.m., which is free to attend, but you are encouraged to make a donation or buy something from their shop. This place runs entirely from private donations with no government funding. So as you can imagine, they've taken a massive hit during the pandemic. And yes, you do get to have a meet and greet with some of the most sociable residents. The people who work here are very friendly, knowledgeable and passionate about what they do. And you can also attend the on-site cookery school where all proceeds go back into the operation. And there we have it. We're now back at the hotel, which brings our three days on Koh Lanta to a close. And I've got to say, I've had a really good time here. I guess my biggest fear or both of our biggest fear was that we'd come here and it would be a bit of a ghost town. You know, it's an island that's known for being quiet anyway. We were just worried that it would seem pretty sad, but that is definitely not the case. If you want a bit of atmosphere, you can head to the towns in the north. And if you want that quiet, romantic vibe, head down south to hotels like this. And Koh Lanta is gonna show you a good time. Tomorrow, we are finally getting on a minibus to take us over to the mainland of Thailand. And I'm really excited to get back over there. So thanks for watching and I'll see you in the next one. Next time, we head over to Krabi province for our first ever visit to one of Thailand's most iconic beaches.